Hello, this is Coffee Hound Retro Sharker, and welcome back to the second episode in what I've called the uh, Ramblecast. Uh, yes, an amazing title. That's pretty much what's going to happen, is uh, another 30-40 minutes of me rambling on about uh, memories of my gaming past and uh, my experience in gaming. The last episode, I covered from my earliest memories to... Was it now yet? Yeah, the end of the Amiga. The sad demise of the Amiga. Uh, through various... Uh, for various reasons. Yes. Uh, I will mention another couple of... As a uh, addendum to the first episode. I forgot to mention. Um, I want to talk about... Uh, the One of the formative Amiga experiences for me. Which was... Uh, Frontier Elite 2. I mentioned this... In kind of in passing last episode um that was the first game which i sank consistent time into like daily daily time daily amounts of time into it uh for weeks and weeks and weeks i think in total i probably played elite frontier regularly for about a year and a half which in an in an age of more throwaway games the the 16-bit era especially for the Amiga and and PC okay on PC DOS that was when games stopped being things you put on for five ten minutes and played for a while or you completed and then if you were lucky enough with the difficulty then moved away um this is when games became complex, more com- complex, where you had role playing in that era, is when you started having, and it was, it, the 8 bit era started having um, more more lengthy, like the cold box game got trans, trans, um, converted to um, like Apple II and C64 and stuff like that. But it was the, the, with the Amiga, we had started having lengthier games. It wasn't just ar- arcade conversions, and as I say, it's it began with Elite. Um, that kind of we prog- um, cons- consistently play the games to progress. But yeah, for me, uh, Frontier Elite Two was the the first time sync, the first big time sync, where I played it and played it and played it to climb through the ranks, to explore more of the game. Uh, fueled by pretty much by my, my by my imagination and regular rereads of the Gazetteer and tales of the frontier, I think it was called the, the storybook. Uh, that because going back to it, there was there wasn't a lot. There actually wasn't a lot to actually to do in Frontier Two, in Frontier Lee Two. Um, there was there were a number of activities, but they got stale very fast. And I was going back to it. I'm not sure how I played it for so long, especially when I effectively dropped myself into a grind, grinding uh, navy missions. I used to be an imperial navy uh, flyer, uh, grinding like dozens and hundreds of those, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of photography missions, um, assassination missions, strike missions. But it was my imagination that kept me going on that, even though, and because I'd never played anything like like that. For me, Frontier, for a while, Frontier was like the dream game alongside, um, I, I was, I was playing like Micro, I'd say I was playing Micro, Microprose games, which had the similar thing where you fly around mission after mission of procedural, procedural generated missions, randomly generated missions. But yeah, that's all there was really in Elite 2. You did a lot of the same things. And I, it's the kind of thing, it's when I did in Nostalgia Nibbles, um, and Tim is play about it and retrospective on, on Twitter, I, I ended up agreeing with Amiga Power's lower score for it. I think it was 60, 73%, I think it was. And they mentioned that it wasn't fun and I kind of agree with them 
it was te- it's a technical marvel, a universe on a disc, and what they did was staggering with the procedural generation of planets and uh, the sheer scale. But there wasn't a lot of fun looking back into it, and I would not play it again. Elite Dangerous feels the, the, the combination of the idea of the best of, the best of Elite, Elite, the original Elite, and the best of Frontier. Even now there is there are grinds in that. It's still it's more restrained in that way in and there's there's more to do uh, it's more towards the original elite um in theme and uh the, the combat is a hell of a lot better than it was in frontier frontier was just jousting back and forth because of the newtonian physics focus but yeah that's that's one thing that was Frontier was my first big time sink. There was the smaller, there was the smaller time sinks. I used to play K K two forty a lot, and as I say, microprose games were a time sink in their own right as well. But they didn't, I didn't, I didn't sink any, anywhere near as much time into uh, those collectively as I did in in Frontier Elite Two. And eventually, I did end up this game burnt out after a year, after a year and a half. I stopped playing it uh, except just little bits and pieces or trying different things and yeah that was that was it another little memory i i think i remembered about it about the amiga was um going back to my parents as well playing this game i used my dad and i used to play this game called shuttle um it was a space shuttle sim basically kerbal kerbal uh space project for the amiga just focused on the on the um, on the shuttle, and there was this there was this brick thick, hello Moogles, come to say hello. Um, there was this brick thick um, manual with it with operating procedures, and you used to have to do for, you had to basically do everything from take off, to um, whatever mission you wanted to do, you needed to do, which is like launch a satellite or dock rendezvous with another another ship. Um, or just launch, and then you took up to that, do the whole thing from that, from ground to orbit to, and then land again. But there was this list of procedures you needed to do at specific times, so it was like an hour, an, at least an hour process, just to take off. It could it could accelerate time, of course, you, you, twice you needed to, unless you wanted to take like four hours of pre-launch in real time. But there was this like I remember it's like a big thick brick book with like the ring binder rings on the side, and my dad and I would team up to play it. I I hid the controls. He was the uh, the Amiga, and I'd have this this book as well as this big poster sized um image of the of the of dials and um screens and where they were on there. So it might say in the book. Do so and so on control A one four, and you you basically look at the poster, look for the match the number on there, and then I tell my dad so we need to do this so and so at so and so time, and we sit there waiting for the time, find the control panel, the right control panel, like it was a big post display of all the control panels. You could cycle around the screen, move the the, the, the angle of the screen to look at all the panels, and. Um, Follow this long, 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 long list of procedures. And um, I remember one Sunday afternoon, uh, we did one entire mission. It was the entire Sunday afternoon to do it, about three or four hours. But it was just like an amazing experience. It was one of my fondest of like co-op experience with my parents. So yeah, that's uh, that's what I wanted to do. Uh, just add on to the last Amiga focused memories because we're moving moving away from that. Um, the last. As I mentioned, the last the last bit of the uh, the first episode, we moved on to after the Amiga started dying, and then died, uh, in the beginning of ninety six, we moved on to the Mega Drive, which we'd never had before, we'd never owned before. So this this is very late in, this is like after after the Mega Drives, the, the commercial life is is winding down as well in favour of the uh, thirty two bits, um, things like Comic Zone and the last gap the last big games had come and gone so Mega Drive was cheap and the Mega Drive games were cheap as well because the PlayStation was out which we'd heard little bits of on the uh, on Bad Influence and seen bits and pieces about it 
Saturn, I think Saturn was probably out as yeah, Saturn would have been out as well. So yeah, the 32 bits had arrived. Um, the Amiga was dead, and uh, 16 bits were cheap now. So we got a Mega Drive from Cash Converters, one of my dad's friends, uh, Nigel, he worked there. So he got us a Mega Drive with Gods and Centurion, Defender of Rome, which is a really good um, strategy RPG, one of the uh, many PC ports. The Genesis, Meg Genesis Stroke Mega Drive seemed to be a a haven for PC ports from games like NHX, the, Star, the amazing Starflight uh, remaster that's on Mega Drive and Genesis, which is lovely. My favourite version of it. Uh, we got that cards, Centurion, and oh, yes, a game called Bob BOB. It's a, um, a robot -y platformer with a one of the most irritating. Um, uh, soundtracks I can remember it just it just feels movies dread just feeling there hearing it it feels just like such a, a dreary drone but the actual platform is quite uh, quite good I think there's a uh, there's, there's a Genesis Mega Drive and SNES version of both I think but I think they differ slightly differently but yes uh, we move on to that uh, well, I think we still bought we still bought one or two um, Amiga games when they turned up I was reminded of one uh, that show and I played called Legends, and I remember now that my mum owned that one. That came out in '96, but it was like just one or two, maybe. Um, so yeah, we got into Mega Drive, and that was great. We're catching up all all the games that um, we missed out on, like Sonic. We never, we never played Sonic before. Um, we'd never played um, a lot of the arcade conversions that we picked up really cheap. We picked we up first, and the Mega Drive was my first um, experience of JRPGs. Never played a JR JRPG, apart from, I guess you count Spirit's Legacy on the Amiga as an attempt at a JRPG by Western developers. It wasn't, wasn't that good. It was a bold attempt for a Zelda-like. But yeah, that was the first, the Mega Drive was when we first played JRPGs. Um, Shining Force 2. We played um, Vermilion, Vermilion Crusade, was it? Vermilion, Sword of Vermilion. That's it, Sword of Vermilion. Which is actually quite decent rogue. Um, early rogue, like before rogue games were popular on, on mainstream platforms. It was rogue, roguelike. Um... Panzer Dragoon, no, not Panzer Dragoon. Fantasy Star Four. That's what we played. We played Fantasy Star Three and Four, Shining Force Two, um, a few other things, anything like Crusader. Um, I think it's, that's a treasure game. Um, Story of Thor. So yeah, that's when our obsession with uh, JRPGs began and we started hunting them down by end like anything we anything we could get hold of. And we also played um Warriors of the Eternal Sun, which is a really decent D D game on the Genesis Mega Drive. Um, we played Buck Rogers, that was really good. Countdown to Doomsday, another another PC to a um console port. Uh Star Trek. There was a, a next generation game on there, it was really good. So yeah, that kept us going. The Mega Drive gave us fresh new experiences, which is what we wanted, what we were looking for, and on the cheap. So through mo most of 96, that kept us going for those. But then, towards summer, my parents started looking, because they were still avid tactical gamers, as, 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 as always. And they started looking at us getting a PlayStation. And if it was any good, as good as we thought it would be, we'd get PlayStations for Christmas. Uh, play, or PlayStation between uh, my brother and I. So yeah, that's when I entered the, uh, a second gaming golden age. Because PlayStation, oh. I can still vividly remember 
when my parents got their PlayStation and bought it home. And put put it on and with the included uh, demo one disc, which um, if you followed me on Twitter for any length of time or on YouTube, I, I rarely, uh, there's rarely a week that goes by without mentioning some, some the de- demo one coming up because it's like the, the codifying... Uh, most, one of the most visceral experiences I got a PlayStation, and that first day of playing demo one, playing uh, Alien Trilogy, playing no, not Alien Trilogy that that came on late, later on a separate demo, but uh, playing Die Hard Trilogy, Crash Bandicoot, looking at the uh, the famous T Rex demo, yeah, um, the Manta one, the trailer for Broken Sword, hearing so much speech. Because coming from the Amiga, where uh, and the Mega Drive as well, um, speech was rare, and on the Mega Drive it was like scratchy. Um, and the Amiga, like it was clear, like, you, you had sampled speech, but it was like sam- the, the rare samples. Um, but this, I'd never heard anything like Broken Sword. So much speech in in one point of click adventure, and I was, I was blown away again when I, when I played the uh, Discworld. I was a, we had, a, we had a demo of Discworld soon after, and that was amazing. As a as a um, a staunch a Discworld fan, hearing Discworld come to life when so many characters speaking, so much speech, it, I played just to hear the characters chatter away. It was that much of a an astonishing thing? And the graphics for PlayStation, we we never seen anything. Three D graphics on the Amiga, what we'll be used to, and on the uh, Mega Drive. And going back to the C64 before then, stuff like Castle Master or the Micro Pro's uh, Fly Tim's just dithered polygons that use you to chug it along at uh, slow frame rates. And then going from that to something like Crash Bandicoot or Destruction Derby 2, we were fascinated by the rolling demo of Destruction Derby 2 in the way in the way we've been fascinated by the, uh, the demo of No Second Prize on the Amiga. It was just such, it was like the, the, the second big paradigm shift. But when we got the Mega Drive, it didn't feel like we got, we would take going like a huge jump, leap forward. Because they were, they were better, but they were still much of what we'd seen on Amiga. But we'd never seen anything like an Amiga on with the PlayStation. It was just such a, such an astonishing leap forward. Um, and yeah. That that was it. The um, I still had my parents swap soon after that. My parents actually swapped their their Amiga for a PlayStation for us. Uh, a friend we used to we bought games off for years. He wanted their Amiga twelve hundred, and it, we did, it basically did a straight swap for the for a PlayStation, which is not a bad deal. Thinking about it now, um, for us. So that was it. Um, I, we, my brother and I, practically drooled over the PlayStation again uh, until Christmas, Christmas roll around. But yeah, that that first day was both my parents and I were just agog at PlayStation at Demo One, just the games there, and that became like one of the most the oh, I should say the most played demo disc ever. It was. Ex- so much, so many hours of entertainment. Week, weeks of entertainment just from that one disc. Weeks of being astonished. But yeah, soon after we started, they um, they bought uh, Command and Conquer. And that was fifty pounds. That was and Crash Bandicoot as well. I remember that my parents bought Crash Bandicoot, um, and then I think when they finished with it, they traded it back in, and I got a thirty-two pounds trading value, which was a lot for them but it was that was that was a big leap another thing as well the big leap in prices um would come from playing from paying anywhere between five and 25 for amiga games on average i remember there was a few we paid higher prices for like legends of valor and blade of destiny i think i think beyond the steel sky was quite expensive it was more expensive it was like 30 pounds plus and that was that was a high tier amiga game um, and then we went to the PlayStation, where fifty pounds was pretty much the common price between forty and fifty. But most most of the big budget games, I mean, this is after 
because we weighed, we hadn't bought one when they launched in 95. By the time like we bought one in mid to late 96, uh, the big the big breakout year games were, were already out, like things like Alien Trilogy, Die Hard Trilogy, Tomb Raider, Crash Bandicoot. So that, and those were all, all higher price games, which will will come into play later on because that's when we stopped with the PlayStation. Was also when we stopped having big collections because we had to part exchange them constantly. But yeah, I'll come, I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, we got, set, we got my brother and I got our PlayStation for Christmas of that year, and I got my. I think the first game I had for it was Thunderhawk Two because I was so I was still so enamoured with um, military flights and particularly um, helicopter gunship games. Thanks to my long association with Microprose on gunship games, Gunship Two Thousand, um, and I had speech as well. That was like it was. Just, I remember we played a, a demo of Thunderhawk Two. It must have been a magazine. We almost started buying um, OPSM official PlayStation UK magazine. Almost immediately, because we started buying, buying demo discs. I remember we had a demo disc of uh, demo of Thunderhawk Two. It was amazing here. Radio messages in speech. Um, I was just used to them in text in Microprose game like F one seven seven A or one seven A, and Gunship. You you might get little little bits of sampled speech, particularly on CD thirty two versions, which we never had and played. Thank thankfully we never thankfully we never bought a CD thirty two. But yeah, just hearing that, and then I bought. I noticed there was um, Macapro's games on on PlayStation as well. I bought Gunship, which I still own in the collection. Um, that was amazing seeing a, a, a modern, what felt like a modern Macapro's game with textured textured graphics and oodles of speech. It's still a really good version of um, Gunship as well. One still, I still really enjoy playing. It's got a few AD, arcade touches, like you can actually dodge missiles, but it's, there's still a solid simulation feel, and the, and the manual's like fittingly thick for a PlayStation, and most of it is in English, uh, rather than several different languages making it thick. It's actually a thick book itself because of the, uh, how, how much it does adhere to the simulation heritage of Mac Pros. Uh, Tomb Raider absolutely blew our socks off um, seeing that. Like, <laughs> the only like game anything like we played anything like that was rig was uh, rig dangerous. Um. Oh gosh, what else did we play? Early on. Command and Conquer just uh, able to, being able to play Command and Conquer being able to play Doom. The PlayStation was when I first played Doom, the, which is a, sort of my favourite version of Doom is the PlayStation version, which has some really neat tricks with um, lighting and uh, unique thing, unique touches that no other version has, unless it's been modded into the PC version since. Be able to play Doom for the first time there. Um, my JRPG, our JRPG ex- experiences um, multiplied there, playing things early on like Super Dean when I first, when I finally came out in 97. Uh, yeah, a handful of months after after buying a uh, PlayStation and then Vandal Arts, my codifying, codifying uh, experience of t- tactical JRPGs, which I still do- dearly love. Um, yeah, unfortunately, being a pal, being a pal gamer, um, for the PlayStation, the it was a thin on the ground for JRPGs. It was a a very very uh, limited pool to draw from, which um, we'll factor on into other things a bit later on, because that centres of of looking to other systems and uh, but yeah, playing and one one thing that felt lovely at the time as well was seeing so many and especially does now being into uh, retro gaming history and studio history was seeing so many Amiga stalwarts called uh, my favorites from that era core design gremlin psychosis basically their name they, uh, my uh, my favorite uh, developer from that era is psychosis they made it over to the PlayStation where so many others didn't um the ocean made a go of it 
with a handful of games. Um, I think che- like Cheesy, the uh, derisable Cheesy was one of their games. I own, I own a, f- a few uh, PlayStation o- Ocean games. But they struggled. They they disappeared early on. Got uh, cobbled up by uh, infograms and then vanished. But Psychosis made it. I mean, they they made Wipeout, one of the one of the breakout games, and uh, for the PlayStation. And and lovely games like um, Overboard, and Crazy Ivan, early on, really cool and uh, cheesy. Uh, Mech Shooter, Colony Wars, G Police. Roll cage eventually on there. They, they made they made the PlayStation their own in Europe, which was lovely to see. But yeah, that's uh, yeah PlayStation. This what was one of the most defining eras of my gaming history, and the ones I've I looked fondest back onto was the PlayStation. But um, one thing that happened was because of the price of games. We also looked at picking up other systems that were cheaper and in our quest and thirst for JRPGs. So somewhere into the PlayStation era for us, we also started for the first time owning and playing multiple systems at once. Before, previously, it had been, we'd like come from C64 and then as soon as the Amiga came along, we dropped the, we dropped the previous system playing it and, and there's some of that with the uh, Mega Drive as well um, we stopped playing the Mii games and then when PlayStation dawned or arrived we pretty much pl- stopped playing everything else I think we, we'd, we'd sold our Mega Drives um, my parents had took their Amiga, game, Amiga and most of their games as well I'd, I'd still got our Amiga but it barely got any play at all now it was just gathering dust for the most part I'd put it on sometimes when I'm on the PlayStation and play a few favourite games and I had my own little collection of games that I'd, I'd picked out and, and hold it over but yeah this time now 97, 98 was when we started for the first time owning and playing multiple systems we bought we kind of just exploded outwards uh, we bought a Saturn and played things like Shining Force eventually played things like Shining Force 3 shown in our holy arc uh, Dragon Force, any 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 JRPGs we get a hold of, uh, probably on Panzer Dragoon as well. We also owned an N sixty four for some time, I think. Though I think I I didn't have mine for long. So we played Golden Eye, um, Shadows of the Emp- Shadows of the Empire. We played. Um, oh, I remember my parents, my mum. Paying eighty pounds for Mr. Good Ninja Go Goman Gomiman. I don't know what I pay that much for. I think we paid seventy pounds for Chew Rock. Uh, paid Super Mario on there as well. Super, Super Mario sixty four. Uh, I think we ended up playing Quest sixty four as well, which is a terrible RPG. But yeah, that's 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 this, this period is when we 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 put we play multiple systems and as many JRPGs we could uh, I think my mum got a Game Boy Colour as well at the time which I eventually uh, inherited for a while before we sold it, before I sold it got a GBA but yeah um, the, the other thing that marks this era of gaming for me is that in 1990 late, late 98 um I started wanting, looking towards wanting a PC for the first time because um, the, the the PlayStation still had uh, only had like a handful of games. So the type the simulator games I liked really liked, like Simulation. I had like Sim City Two Thousand, which wasn't a great version. There was nothing like Utopia. There was nothing like Elite. There's a handful like the Colony was great. But once I'd done that, that that's pre- I, I played Colony Wars to death. Um, Dark Light Conflict was good. Played that to death. So um, I missed, I think, eventually, after I played the, uh, the Final Fantasy VII hype had uh, worn away and uh, 
played JRPGs to death. Like we played Sukadin over and over again, played Vanthalos over and over again, and they were still thin on the ground. Very few, very few got localized for PAL. Um, I started looking at PCs and to play the things I missed on the Amiga. I missed on the PlayStation. The genres are there. So Christmas '98, I got a second hand, my first PC, a second hand. Uh, Pentium 1, 133 megahertz with 16 megabytes of RAM, uh, no graphics, no no 3D accelerator, um, a Sound Blaster 16, 1.2 gigabytes, and I think it ran Windows 95, like re- the ver- B version, the second version there. And that was great because I, I remember I picked up a load of uh, cheap DOS games from Cash Convert, I had a big stack of them with the Westwood 10th anniversary. Uh, Syndicate Plus, all, a load of games I wanted to play, uh, I've, I've, I've always heard of, or seen, it's like the Cine Amiga versions of, but could never find, so that was great, um, I think I kind of started, that's why that's, that's I started drifting away from PlayStation now, when I got that PC, that was like 1999, I don't remember playing that, that many PC, um, PlayStation games, or buying that many new games. I started just drifting towards PC for a while. Um, playing Fallout. Played Fallout for the first time, which is amazing. That was like retro futuristic post apocalyptic RPG. I like, don't ever played stuff like Burn Time in the Amiga. Uh, never seen anything like uh, Fallout, which is great. Um, played a load of old flight and the older flights in Longbow, the Jane series, Longbow. I always wanted to, I remember seeing I remember seeing Longbow running on a PC in the store when we started the Amiga and, and just being a gog at its um, th- textured graphics getting to play that playing Jane, Jane Strike Joint Strike Fighters I think it was and fight, Fighters Anthology that was it like it was a uh, compilation of bit or of uh, different eras of of planes from propeller to uh, modern jets and there was Loads of campaigns as well. I think it was a compilation of several different James games that had been mashed together. That was great. Um, what did they play as well? The um, digital. I forgot now. There was there's some ones we made DOS late in DOS and early Win era um, helicopter games. Digital. I can't remember what they call now. Those were, those were great. I played first played. Um, Wing, oh, I first played with Wing Commander 3, that's why I first played on the PlayStation as well. I got my first, oh, that's one thing I forgot, that, that was like my first big experience of FMV games was the PlayStation, that, that was just where that wowed us. I still have such a, a fondness for FMV games, thanks to playing Wing Commander 3 and 4 on the uh, PlayStation, I was such a, a mad fan of uh, Wing Commander on the Amiga. So getting to play number three, which I'd see, I remember seeing on and the PC version of in stores when we had a uh, the Amiga and the Mega Drive, um, it just looked and looked like the most amazing game. I remember picking up the box, the DOS PC DOS box for it. It was a huge box, heavy thing, with the screenshots of like, real actors, real actors on the back of the box. Mark Hamill and uh, Malcolm McDowell, and it's, it's amazing. God, it would move. You can play actual movie. We got loads of experiences on those on PlayStation to the point of sickness, to be honest, until uh, we're thoroughly bored of uh, FMV games. But yeah, back to uh, back to PC. Um, I, I've been playing uh, private custom of those again. I, got, I picked up the PC version of uh, Wing Commander 3 and 4, which I found out the PlayStation was a cut down version of. Had different miss- had missions cut out. I played the Privateer. Probably did too. Um, but then, like, now when 1999 rolled around, things like Half Life came out, which would run poorly on my um, PC, even even with uh, a 3D FX. 3D, we eventually got um, a, a 3D FX Voodoo Banshee put into my PC, um, which ran the Half Life okay. I think it was just, just about the. Uh, just about runnable specs for it at the time. I think you needed like a P90, I had P133, so it was a bit better. Um, but then 
my parents, my parents, uh, my my dad had been like seeing my PC and the PC games I played. I think he started missing the Amiga as well. So they eventually bought in, I want to say in 1999, sometime in 1999, they bought a PC as well, half a friend, a, uh, one which was better than mine. I was a bit jealous because theirs had, there was a one six, theirs was a one six six megahertz um, MMX with 32 megabytes of RAM, I think it was. And they got themselves a, a graphics card as well, a, three, a 3D accelerator card, I can't remember which one. Um, but yeah, that was great. So they started, well, mum started to stick with the place. She was, ter- she was terrified of PCs, of Windows, uh, afraid of breaking something. That persisted for, for years and years and years. Um, my dad, so my mum stuck with consoles. She was still playing uh, all the platformers and and uh, adventure games and uh, RJRPGs, any kind of RPG. And my dad started drifting away, like I did, back to back to home, back to PCs, home computers, so now on PC. So, yeah, that was that was like the end of for a while, the end of end of my, my mainstreaming involvement in consoles. As two thousand rolled around, I bought a, a better PC. Well, it's better than my, it was better than the PC I had. It was a terrible deal. One one from PC World. I I remember, I remember asking asking the person. Well, this well, this because I didn't, I don't mentions of a Doom three. This was in two thousand when Doom Doom three was like years away. We heard mentions of it. I, was, I remember asking, uh, "Will this run Doom three? It was like, "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah." It will. It was a, it was a, a, a HP Pavilion. 533 megahertz which is like a significant step up 64 megabytes of ram um oh and some kind of it wasn't what i found out it wasn't it wasn't a dedicated graphics card it was like shared memory so i had like in essence 56 megabytes of ram and eight megabytes was shared with this i think there was some kind of um, graphics card. I, I I I have a feeling it was a Riva TNT, thirty two megabyte Riva TNT. But you use eight megabytes of shared RAM as, so I mean, in fact I only had eight megabytes. I think I think the um the eight megabytes went to like VGA RAM, like um inbuilt RAM, video RAM, just to run the uh, thing. But it meant like games was games were starting to move to sixty four megabytes minimum. So I struggled with games that need to say you got sixty four you need sixty four megabytes of RAM. And on paper my PC had my HP pavilion with the big the monitor at the uh, the big speakers on the side that like hung off the monitor. Um on paper my system had sixty four megabytes of RAM, but it only had fifty six megabytes of usable RAM. Um so I used to get I used to get like warnings saying you've got enough RAM. Um and it was one of our systems. That was so. It was one of those the um like the slightly rounded off squarish things that were very popular in like two thousand. Um, it was too small, but it was too cramped to put anything in. Like it couldn't be upgraded either. Uh, there wasn't enough room to put extra RAM in, which is wasn't wasn't great. Um, but for all these flaws, and there were many, it gave me my first experience with emulation. That wasn't that was another big big thing for me in gaming history was getting into emulation at the time because I finally had um, semi-regular access to the internet so I found my way after hearing mentions of emulators and learning a bit better than them I remember buying um, you could actually buy discs in like HMV of emulators like C64 classics Spectrum classics they were just basically just discs full of ROMs pulled off the net but it was solve money in like HMV in game um, I had to have one of those, but the, sim- the emulators on the disc were old ones that didn't really run. Um, so I, I remember vividly downloading CCS64. Um, I, I, I experimented with Nesticle and uh, Blood Cyst and, and some of the early early emulators. Um, but yeah, once I remember when I got, when I got CC, uh, CCS64, a really accessible and decent um, C64 emulator. I don't know if, if, if Vice was out then, it might have been, but it's just, 
I, I like I, I stuck with CCS, CCS 64 for years. Um, that was great. Being able to play. Nostalgia for the old systems was just about kicking in. But the biggest thing for me was being able to play SNES and Mega Drive games, and SNES and Genesis games that I'd never played before. So thanks to Z, good old Zed SNES 64, uh, Zed SNES, sorry, just Zed SNES, I first played Chrono Trigger and Final Fantasy VI, which hadn't come out at all on, um, on, play, on in, and yet had Western releases. I don't think the, uh, well, Chrono Trigger on PlayStation never, never made it over. I think there was a Final Fantasy anthology that came out in, on PlayStation in 2000, I think. But yeah, that's when I first had my first experiences of those games, the, the games, the, the, the big SNES and Mega Drive games, I'd never been able to play. Um, just simply weren't re- around by the time I got SNESes. That's another thing that's, I forgot to mention. Uh, we picked up a SNES cheap as well in like 97, 98. And I got um, the person I bought off the market from had um, an import cartridge, an import converter we plugged into the SNES and had loads of import cartridges. So I first played things like Wing, the Wing Commander ports, Shadow Run, Battletech, things that never made it over and PAL territories. But again, like I sold those on um, when I got the PC and uh, PlayStation. By this time as well, we'd, we'd started consolidating down um, my parents, I remember the last thing that my parents bought for their N64 was um, Ocarina of Time. And they played that through. That was like the, the, the first game they bought for the play, for the N64 for, for ages, months and months and months. They played that through and then they just sold up. Like we, we started consolidating down. I, I got a, uh, a PS, so I'd, I'd sold my original PlayStation. And then, actually, no, I didn't. No, I, didn't I, I thought they'd sold it. Because recently, well, the past year, it was unearthed. Well, I think it was my PlayStation, original PlayStation, was unearthed from uh, the attic, along with other games. But yeah, we started. We started after a, after a few years of splurging it everywhere in all directions on different systems. Playing Pan, we, we were fortunate to play Panzer Dragoon Saga uh, on Saturn on release as well. Um, though my my mama had to. Uh, Order in, order it in specially from the, uh, the the person she bought games from because no one else would stock it because Saturn was so well dead by then in the UK. But yeah, after 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 several years of playing lots of systems, we started consolidating down. Um, my parents, my mum stuck with the PlayStation. My dad stuck with his PC. I stuck with my PC. Um, and that was it pretty much through 2000. I, I remember I bought a PS1 specifically to buy to play import games on. But even that, that didn't get a lot of use. I was just like... Um, I was I was, I, I was saturated with PlayStation. I'd had enough. Um, so, yeah. It was the year, 2000 was a year of mainstream like for me mainline play play pc game i play things like Baldur's gate Baldur's gate 2 um the hebler 2 uh, emulators games back net, net access um yeah playing loads of playing like earthbound for the first time chrono trigger final fantasy 6 which was lovely um yeah and that was pretty much it until the following year. And that's when I lapsed back, I got back into consoles again. But that's something I will cover in the next issue, um, the next episode. Is uh, what happened when I got back into uh, console gaming again after a good, good two years of sporadic and then non-existent playing. But it's got something to do with... Uh, Powered by a certain uh, emotion engine, that's well. That's the ne- the next the next phase in my uh, gaming memories is uh, what happened then. So I hope you've enjoyed this uh, rambling uh, discussion of uh, my gaming memories of the uh, later nineties, phase two, and uh, hope you join me again for the next ones uh, where we uh, delve into a new generation. So until then, thank you for listening. And uh, this is Coffee Hound Retro Sharker signing off. <laughs>